We're looking now at a fallacy that's very, very common called the appeal to popularity. And we're going to do eight main things here. We're going to talk about what the appeal to popularity consists in. Then we're going to look at the structure of the argument. It turns out to have a relatively simple structure to it. After that, we'll look at why this is a fallacy, what makes it a bad kind of argument. We'll look at some common situations where you're likely to see the, the appeal to popularity arise. Then we'll look at several examples of the fallacy. If you want to see further examples, we'll be uploading videos that, that just do that later on. We're going to talk about how to spot it, what are the red flags that you should be on the lookout for. We'll talk about what other fallacies it sometimes gets mistaken for, and we'll finish up by talking about how to avoid this fallacy in your own thinking, your own argument. So what does the fallacy of appeal to popularity consist in? At its essence, what it involves is arguing that because many people believe a claim to be true, the claim is actually true and you ought to accept the claim. Now, it has a lot of synonyms. Each one of these that you see here uh, is, is one way in which it's talked about, sometimes in, in critical thinking textbooks, logic textbooks, communications textbooks, rhetoric textbooks, English textbooks. This is one that you'll almost always see people talking about, but th the language isn't always uh, consistent. You'll see some Latin verbiage like argumentum ad populum or consensus gentium, gentium, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, both of those can be translated roughly into appeal to popularity or, or common consent, and you'll see common consent also getting used, um, among other synonyms. Bandwagon appeal gets used quite often when we're talking about political science or civics textbooks or uh, English textbooks. Appeal to the masses, again, in, in uh, uh, context where we're talking about propaganda. All of these really have the same basic um, structure or appeal to them, which is saying that, look, a lot of people buy this claim, you should buy the claim. So let's look now at the actual structure of this, this fallacy. And you notice that we have just two premises. One of them, the one in brackets, is an implicit premise. Uh, if you make it explicit, then people are going to say, wait a second, this is not good argumentation. So usually it's left unstated. Uh, the first premise, you notice I've got some other words in brackets. Sometimes people say many people, sometimes people say most, sometimes you know a lot, sometimes all. But the premise works like this. You're saying that there's a claim out there, X. X is the case. Many people believe that claim to be true. Many people believe that X is the case. Now, how do you get from that to you should believe X to be the case or X is true? It's that hidden premise. When many people believe something to be the case, it actually is the case. We know that that's not really a, a, a premise that we ought to accept if you lay it out like that, but usually it's going on uh, without us thinking about that. And that's what makes us such a, an, an insidious fallacy. So that's the structure if we want to lay it out in terms of premises and conclusions. If we want to look at it in, in a more graphic form, here's one that you could, you could use. Um, there's different ways of representing this, but I think this is a good way. So you notice we've got this mass of people who think that claim is tr that claim X is true, and you could have one person, you know, all the way to three. If you've got a pretty small group, could be a thousand people, could be a million people. It doesn't really matter how many people we're going to pile up in here. What matters is that the structure says, look, this whole bunch of people says that the claim is true, so you should think that this claim is true. Now, that leads us to why this is a fallacy. And there's a couple different points I want to make here. One is that there's a confusion or a conflation or a blurring together that's happening between two things that we really should keep separate from each other. One of these is thinking that a claim is true or well-supported. That's one thing. On the other side, we have that a claim is being accepted or believed by many people. These are not the same. The fact that something's true doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with it, although they probably should if it's you know pretty self-evident. The fact that something is agreed to by a lot of people doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. But a lot of people blur these together. 
Now, you notice the next point, I have this with some exceptions in parentheses. There are some exceptions to this. But in most cases, the truth of a claim does not depend on it being accepted by many people or a majority of people or a lot of people or even all people. There are a few exceptions if we're talking about linguistic usage, um, customs, you know, performative things. These, these can be um, exceptions, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Often the claim may be about matters that aren't actually known or particularly well understood. Um, so, you know, you should ask yourself, should we be making claims about this and relying on, on these guys over here as, as our criterion for that? Another thing to keep in mind is we, we actually have an experience of many historical examples where arguments that are based on popularity turn out to have false conclusions, you know. There's all sorts of things, not only in the history of, of religion or politics or, you know, old wives' tales where people thought that certain things were true when they didn't turn out to be so, even in the history of science. Uh, and we could give some examples of those. Just one of them I'll throw in there. Um, you know, 100 years ago, people believed that radio waves were carried by something they called ether. And turns out that's not really the case. We have a different theory that accounts for things better. Um, the fact that a lot of people believed that it was true in the literature of the time, you know, used that as, as sort of a, a touch point when they were talking science, um, doesn't mean that it was actually the case. Now, what are some common situations in which you're liable to run into an appeal to popularity? Well, one of these is advertising. And advertising uses this an awful lot. I do want to attune you to one thing that we're going to hit on later on, which is that um, if you're talking about, you know, four out of five dentists, that's not necessarily an appeal to popularity because you're talking about experts there. But we'll, we'll come back to that uh, later on. Now, oftentimes advertising will say, you know, most of the customers preferred Coke to Pepsi or Pepsi to Coke. So therefore, you should drink that. Or um, more people prefer this brand in these circumstances. More people call upon this pest control or, you know, wear these shoes. So therefore, you should be doing that. Um, it's also used in aesthetic judgments, and this overlaps with, with advertising to a certain extent. What we're talking about with aesthetic judgments, you know, the fashion industry, music, uh, food, all sorts of things where taste is involved. So if, you know, nine out of 10 people prefer this pizza, that must be the best pizza. Uh, and you should eat it. It's probably healthy for you. You know, nine out of 10 believe that this is a good, um, you know, album to buy. You should buy that album. It's also used a lot in politics and policy making. Um, when it gets used, it tends to get used because people have managed to do some sort of public opinion poll that got people to see things their way. There's all sorts of ways you can skew polls. But if you ask the questions the right way, you can often get people to say, yeah, I, I go along with that. Doesn't mean that it's the best thing to do. Doesn't mean that it, it becomes true as a result. Um, we can talk about institutional settings like education, um, you know, businesses, They'll, you know, what do the what do the employees think, or you know, what do the majority of the customers think? And again, it doesn't necessarily make things uh, true, right, just. Um, we have to be on guard about that. Deciding moral issues. This is a really big one. Um, some people think that right and wrong is primarily a matter of um, whether you can get people to to weigh in and say yes, I think that's that's the case. It could be. And there are some circumstances where the majority of the population thinks that a particular thing is good to do, but it's actually the wrong thing to do. People can be deceived about these, these sorts of things. Now, another thing to point out, there are a lot of people in our society, and this is something that I think you can say throughout all time, that have used popularity as a guide for reasoning about their own purchases, their lifestyles, other decisions, what it is that they think is real, what's true, what's valuable. And that's part of why this is such a prevalent and powerful fallacy. Let's look at some examples now. So example one, um, popular music, we could substitute other bands in here if we wanted to. 
And we, we could even go further back in time and talk about, you know, best hits of 1776, you know. Um, there was an album of that sort that came out a while ago. And here I'm picking on the Beatles. Um, I actually personally think they're a little bit overrated, uh, but, you know, that's, that, that's me. So let's look at this. The Beatles have sold over 264 million albums worldwide, more than any other artist in history. So the Beatles are clearly the best musical artist of all time. Well, that doesn't seem to follow, does it? But people do make these kind of arguments. Um, whoever sells the most albums to the most people is the best musical artist. That's the bit of information that you have to shove in there. You have to be assuming in order to make this work. So that's the implicit premise. Once you actually lay that implicit premise out, you can see that this is a fallacy and we shouldn't accept this as, as true. Um, example two, this is a really interesting one. Extended warranties. If you ask most industry experts in most industries, they will tell you that extended warranties are not a good deal for the customer. They're a great deal for the manufacturer or for you know the, the franchise that's selling the extended warranty because most times you don't actually uh, need the extended warranty. Um, now, a salesperson will come up to you and they will try to sell you the extended warranty and they'll say, you know, think about all the things that could go bad. Most people want the peace of mind that comes with getting the extended warranty. Most people do take the extended warranty, so you should do that too. You're getting the extended warranty, aren't you? It's the right thing for you to do. Now, it is actually the case that in, in some areas, most people do, in fact, buy the extended warranty. Does that mean that it's the best thing for you to do? No, it doesn't. Again, this is a case where most people say one thing and the experts who are actually looking at the, the you know statistics are saying a different thing. Um, let's think about a, a third one, political mandates. This comes up quite often every four years when we have a presidential election. And somebody gets the popular vote. And in this case, I'm giving, I'm giving this candidate 55% of the popular vote, which is more than, than the last several presidents have, have gotten. Um, so President Q gets a, an astounding 55% of the popular vote in the last election. That's great for them. And then people will reason from that, usually talking heads in political shows. Therefore, President Q has a clear mandate from the people to enact the policies that she sees fit made a woman president in this case. Um, now, what's the assumption being made there? Getting a majority of the popular vote in an election gives the president a, quote, mandate from the people. That means that, you know, they ought to enact the policies that they ran on or they think are best. And is that really how we ought to think of things? Uh, you know, maybe they do have a mandate from the people in a certain sense. Um, but having a mandate from the people doesn't mean your policies are actually right, because people will vote for all sorts of stupid things and actually have throughout, throughout history. Um, they still do it today. And I want to say both parties are pretty equal opportunity offenders in, in this respect. Um, now, this is an interesting case for another reason, too. It leaves out the fact that if we want to talk about a mandate uh, from the population, 55% of the, the vote uh, doesn't actually mean 55% of the population because not everybody votes. It means you got 55% of the people who voted, and if turnout is only 55%, you got you know something like a little over a quarter of the population to actually think that your policies are, are the best policies. So, again, we want to be careful with these sorts of arguments. Now let's think about how to spot this fallacy. How can you tell when somebody else is engaging in this? So one rule of thumb that I have is pay attention to the reasons that a person gives you for why you should accept the claim. Are they making an appeal or reference to numbers, to popularity? Are they saying most people or lots of people or everybody? Another thing, ask yourself, is the matter under discussion the kind of thing where the number of people who believe it to be true is significant for the truth of the claim? Or is it something where it could be true and almost everybody could think that it's false, but it's actually true? Um, some matters actually, you know, could involve 
um, appeal to popularity without it being fallacious. But most matters aren't that sort of thing. Also, watch out for people who seem to regard popularity as one of the most or even the only significant factor for deciding whether something is true or not. That should be a red flag right there. People like that quite often are the ones who are swayed by popularity. They tend to sort of like retransmit it through the body politic, through the economy, through our culture. So, you know, you want to watch out for, for that sort of uh, character. Now, let's also talk about other fallacies that get mixed up with the appeal to popularity, which aren't the appeal to popularity. So arguments that invoke the majority of a group of experts, like that four out of five dentists say, you know, chew sugarless gum, four out of five dentists prefer, you know, Crest or Colgate or whatever toothpaste to, to the other toothpaste. Those are really appeals to authority. You're just assembling a bunch of experts. You're not doing an appeal to one single authority. It's not an appeal to popularity. Um, another one that gets mixed up with appeal to popularity is appeal to tradition. And this one has to do with arguments that run along the lines of, well, you know, a lot of people in the past have thought that this is the case, so we should think that it's the case now. Notice that there you've got a connection between past and present. In the appeal to popularity, you're not looking at the past, you're looking just at the present and saying, look, a lot of people right now think that this is the case, so you should think that it's the case. So there's a difference there in that there's, there's a connection to the past in appeal to tradition. Another one that is easy to mix up with appeal to popularity because it's really a difference in emphasis as opposed to any sort of stark differentiation is the appeal to common practice. And the appeal to common practice argues that because something is done in our society or done by many people, it's the right thing to do. So, you know, you could say there's, there's an implicit appeal to popularity involved in there, but in critical thinking, we often distinguish these two fallacies apart from each other. Another thing that we want to say is not every argument that brings up or emphasizes the fact that a lot of people believe or choose something, you know, we're using X here, it are necessarily fallacious. Um, there are a few types of areas like, again, language, where uh, common usage does dictate um, what is right or what is wrong. And that's why dictionaries are, are not, you know, some sort of thing coming down from on high. They're actually reflect they're reflective of what it is, at least for most languages. The French are a little bit weird that way. They have the Académie Française. Most languages, the dictionary represents what it is that most people are, are you know, expecting a word to mean or thinking a word to mean. Um, let's talk now about how to avoid falling into this fallacy of appeal to popularity in your own thinking, in your own practice. One thing you can do, pay close attention to your own claims and arguments, the ones that you're making to other people and the ones you're making to yourself. And ask yourself, how much importance are you giving to popularity when it comes to these sort of claims? Uh, another useful thing you can do is remind yourself every once in a while about the many historical examples where the majority turned out to be wrong in deciding what was true or false. And then, you know, when you find yourself making an appeal to popular opinion or taste to decide some matter, which you're going to do sooner or later, ask yourself, could I rework this? Could I find some other criteria and use that to argue for why this is a good thing, or this is a bad thing, or this is right, or this is wrong, or this is true or false. If you can't find some other criteria, you're probably doing the appeal to popularity, and you want to try to um, cut that out. Now, the last thing I want to say is that this video is part of a whole series discussing common fallacies in reasoning and argument, and it belongs to a whole channel a new channel devoted specifically to critical thinking, reasoning, and argumentation. We're going to be bringing out all sorts of other uh, additional uh, series uh, and, and other videos in this particular series. So if you like this video, you find it useful for yourself, share it with other people, uh, spread it around, and come back to the channel to check out what we've got coming up.